Welcome to the, the Sunday School session of New Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church, where Reverend Ronald Spies is the pastor and Trustee Daryl Marcus is our Sunday School Superintendent. Our lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. And the title of our lesson today is called To Heal. To heal, when you heal something, you cure it, mend it, make well, help, or relieve. And we are called to heal, to bring relief. Again, that's Mark, the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. Now, our previous lessons, we dealt with Jesus traveling through Galilee, um, preaching and performing miracles. And the more he preached and the more miracles he performed, he, the fame grows. As people hear more and more about him, the crowd just grows and grows. And so today we're going to deal with a lesson um, where Jesus is again preaching, and he is drawing a crowd. So we're going to start with verse 1 of Mark, the second chapter, and it says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Now, in Capernaum, this is where Peter was staying before he was following Jesus around. This is where G um, Peter was standing. Jesus would often go there to Capernaum. And when he showed up, word got out that Jesus was in town. People had heard about Jesus. Like I said, his fame was growing. And they probably had promised themselves, well, the next time he's in town, I'm going to be there where he's at. Because Jesus is working miracles and teaching like nobody else ever had. And in verse 2 it says, And straightway many were gathered together, in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. So word has got out that Jesus is at this house, probably Peter's house, and people rush there. And it says that there were so many that got to that house that there was no room. They couldn't get inside the house, so they crowded around the door. And it got to the uh, point that there wasn't even any room around the door. The crowd just gathered so quick, and he preached to them. Um, there was no standing room near Jesus. And then verse 3 says, And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now five friends, they've heard about Jesus too, and they're on their way to that house to see him. But of course, they are traveling slow, because one of the friends is sick. Four of them carry him on the bed, um, and he has palsy, which is a form of paralysis. So they had to travel slower. Then everybody else, everybody else could run, could get there as quick as they could, but they just had to travel slow. They didn't want to um, drop him off the bed or anything. They had to take their time. So, but they finally reached the house where Jesus was. And verse 4 tells us, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. So they get there where Jesus is at, and there's a crowd, such a crowd, and they can't even get near him. But they are determined, and of course their friend wants a miracle. He's heard how Jesus has healed, and he wants to be healed of his paralysis. So they've got a problem. They can't get near Jesus. And their friend is sick and needs help. So what are you going to do? So they came up with a solution. Uh, go up on the roof. Now, in, in Bible time, their, their roof were not as ours. Ours was slant, but theirs was flat. And they used their roofs a lot. Their roof was like another room in the house. That's why they had stairs that you could go up outside. Because it was just normal for them to go upstairs. They would even put a rail around the roof of the house to keep people from falling off because they stayed up there so much. They would use it, go up there to meditate, or they would put things up there. As a matter of fact, uh, we can read in the Bible that David was on the roof walking around when he saw Bathsheba taking her evening bath. So it was up at the roof. They just went up the roof. They used it a lot. Um, their roofs were made much different than ours. They would have the wooden beams of the house, and then they would lay straw mats 
um, on that, and then on top they would put clay that would harden. Uh, and then every year they would have to repair their roofs. So it wasn't like um, the friends was going up there doing reckless destruction. When I when I read this years ago, I wondered. I said, "I'm working at Telford Roof." The fact that they could pull it apart with their hands showed that their roofs was nothing like ours. And um, they repaired their roofs every year before the rainy season. So it wasn't just reckless destruction. They knew that the roof would be easy enough to fix, and they were determined to get their friend to Jesus. Just think about it. How determined are you to help your friends? Or how determined do you think your friends will be to help you? These friends were determined. They had made their trip. And they were determined that he was going to get near Jesus. Verse 5 tells us, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Um, in this verse, Jesus is letting us know that our deepest need is the healing of the soul. Sure, we mindful of our bodies, but what we really need is our soul cured. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes in life, um, your mind, your mental condition can have an effect on your body. I've heard it say you can, deal your, you can dig your grave with your fork. The way we eat, we can make ourselves sick. If we eat the wrong thing. Um, I want to share something with you that happened to me on last week. Um, usually we, we film our video, our Sunday school uh, lessons on Wednesday. Well, of course, you know, last Wednesday we had the disturbance surrounding the Capitol. Um, but I was careful not to turn my TV on. Didn't want to watch, didn't want to become distracted because I knew I had been assigned to teach. At Wednesday, so I didn't want my mind messed up. So I was very protective, and I wouldn't turn on the TV. But of course, on the phone, you know, you have your little news items pop up. And of course, I would scroll and see that, look, read a little bit of it. But I wouldn't get deep into it. Um, so anyway, came here, did what I had to do. And then that following day, Thursday, and you know, it was to talk all about what happened in the Capitol. So I said, well, I'm not on, on, on duty tonight to teach anything. We might turn on the TV and let's see what's get into it even more. So I turned on my TV and for about six hours, approximately, could have been more, for six hours, I sat in my, um, I got in my recliner and I just immersed myself in the talk. I found the 24 hours news station. You know, you have a pick of them. And I went from one news station to the next and just immersed myself in the talk surrounding the disturbance at the Capitol. I listened to this commentator, what they had to say, and that commentator, and the news pundits. <laughs> That's a funny word to me. Just listen to everybody's attitude, I mean, talk about what had happened. And I sat there, and I wouldn't turn. It's like I became hypnotized. And as I sat there, I felt myself going down. But it's like I couldn't turn away, or I wouldn't turn away. Um, and But on, on Thursdays, we do have intercessory prayer. I'd like to invite you to join us on Thursdays for our intercessory prayer. It starts every, um, every Thursday at 7.30. And I started looking at the clock, cause, um, and I usually try to support that to be a part of it. And I looked at it because I knew I needed prayer. <laughs> because as I sat and watched the news my attitude, I, I got into a very unholy attitude. What I did, what I had done was I had opened up the door and I had invited some demons to come in there and sit with me and keep me company. And they did, and they talked to me, and they whispered to me. I want you to think about this. We have our material goods at home. Usually, most of us lock our doors. We lock our doors, we have an alarm system, we put an alarm on our car to protect our car. We have our outside motion lights. We have our cameras. We do all of this to protect our material goods. Mm. What do you do to protect your spiritual goods? And you do have some spiritual goods. You do have spiritual valuables mm -hmm. like your peace of mind, mm -hmm. your joy, um, the vision God has given you. What do you do to protect that? 
Now, would you open up your door, if a crook was outside, would you open up your door and invite them in and say, come on in. Here, here's the key to my car, here's the key to the house. There's my TV, got a nice TV, it's a nice computer back there. That's my pocketbook with my money. Come on in, would we do that? No, we would not. So why do we invite the devil, so to speak, to come in and steal our spiritual valuables? That's what I had done. The Bible tells us whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just pure and lovely, good report with virtue and praise, think on these things. We have to watch out for our thoughts because our thoughts become actions. Now, over 40 years ago, I prayed and I asked the Lord to save me and to deliver me from destructive, demonic thoughts. Mm -hmm. And he did that. He delivered me from that dark thinking. And when God does something for you, when God delivers you, mm -hmm. you should do everything within your power to stay delivered. Mm -hmm. And usually I am mindful of my thoughts. But that Thursday, I just last week, I just missed it. So I was there sitting waiting for prayer. And I said, oh, I need prayer. Finally, at prayer time, I cut that TV off. And as I was dialing, I had a headache. I didn't start off the day with a headache. But sitting there watching six hours about that disturbance, I had a headache. But I didn't want to go take anything. I didn't want to miss prayer. I dialed into our prayer line and I said, as soon as I get off this prayer call, first of all, I thank the Lord that I didn't have to pray, that I wasn't scheduled to pray because I was not in a praying mood. But I said, as soon as I get off this prayer call, I'm about to go in there and take me something for this headache. <laughs> but anyway, I dialed in and I opened up my spirit. I knew I needed healing. I opened up my spirit to the scripture that was read, to the remarks that was read, and to the prayer. And praise God, by the time I got off of that prayer call, my headache was gone. So that was, I knew God was telling me, you did this to yourself. You see what you did to yourself. You opened up the door and let the devil come in and mess with your mind. And, it, and you ended up with a headache and uh, other spiritual problems. But thank you, God, Lord, he delivers. He'll deliver you again and again. He'll help you on past that. So just want to share that just to show you how we can hurt ourselves uh, where we need healing. We can make our own selves sick. We can make our own selves have a nervous breakdown. You can give yourself ulcers by the way you think. So, uh, and, and we need to be mindful of that. So just wanted to share that with you, how we can make ourselves sick. But God is willing to hear you. Heal me. Let's move on to verse 6. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Uh, why does this man does speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now in our lesson it says this man was sick of the palsy. Him and his friends showed up there. And there were so many people there. They couldn't get inside the house. But look who was in there sitting down. Mm -hmm. The scribes. They got there early enough. And this should remind us. Sometimes you can drag it to church. But you know who's going to get there on time? The devil. The devil had a seat. They didn't want a miracle. They really weren't. They're concerned about what Jesus had to say. They were just. Because they felt. These, are, these scribes were people who knew the law. They knew scripture. They um, Back then they didn't have the printers. Or the copiers like we did. So if they wanted the scripture, somebody had to write it. They had to write it by hand. And that's what these scribes were. They were experts of the law. So they felt like they knew it, but Jesus' popularity is growing. People usually run to the scribes, the Pharisees, Sadducees, high priests, and all of them. But now instead of coming to them, they were flocking to Jesus. And these people were jealous. And so whenever Jesus was around, they would show up too just to see what he had to say, to see if they could find something wrong. They didn't love to come around him and ask crazy questions. They were just there. They were his jealous enemies, and they would always show up. So they was there sitting. They was there where they could be right there close to Jesus, checking out everything he had to say. And sure enough, as he spoke to the man, they thinking within their hearts, they didn't say it out loud, um, 
who can forgive sins? And when you speak blasphemy, blasphemy was um, speaking evil against God. Um, these people, they love to follow. As you read in the um, Gospels, um, you will see what at various times they would come and they would ask questions to try to trip Jesus up. One time the scribes came to Jesus, bringing um, he was in the temple teaching, and they come, here they come with a woman they said was caught right in the act of adultery, interrupting his teaching, saying, Jesus, this one was called an act of adultery. Now, Moses said, we should stone him. What do you say? But what, but what do you say? If Jesus had said, go ahead and stone him, that would have made him look hard to the people because he had a crowd around him, as usual. And if he said, well, don't, don't stone him, then it looked like he was going against the law. Mm -hmm. So they were just there to ask questions and to trip him up. But he gave them, uh, instead, he just, uh, this when he stooped down on the ground and wrote, and they kept pressure. All right, Jesus, speak up. What are we supposed to do? We got our rocks. Do we kill this woman or do we let her go? And finally, Jesus said to them, you without sin can't cast the first stone. And that's just an example of what these scribes would do, how they would follow Jesus around and try to make him look bad in front of the people. They never could. But these, they, and they stayed his enemies. And they always followed him. And down here in verse 8, it says, And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Now, we like to say, people like to say, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. There are times when I wish he didn't know my heart, but I know it's for my benefit does he, that he does because by him knowing my heart, he knows how to fix me. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he, he could, um, and that was a miracle right there for them to help them, to let them know that Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking, but it still didn't change them. Um, in verse nine, he goes on and he says, um, whether is, is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he turned to say to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed. And glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. We would say, we ain't never seen nothing like this before. Mm -hmm. Jesus was just amazing. And as we look at our lesson, the thing is, what can we learn from it? Are we going to be like, uh, are we going to uh, be like these blind guys, these scribes who are following around, finding fault, or are we going to try to learn from what we see mm -hmm. Jesus does doing. Now, as we see, he healed the man, and that's what the man wanted. He wanted healing. Um, Jesus had already told him his sins were forgiven, but he also wanted that healing. And what we can learn from this to apply to ourselves is we also have a call to be a healing force mm -hmm. wherever we go. We have been called to cure to men, to make well, to help, to relieve. We have been called to help bring relief wherever we go. Um, as I, um, I was raised up in the church, and as a child, I was on the, um, the junior choir, the little choir, and they would teach us the hymns. Um, the songs didn't mean much to me then, but thank the Lord, they, I, I can appreciate them now. One song they taught us was called Bright in the Corner, Where You Are. That song is said, um, and it's amazing how I can still remember the verses. Even today, I can lose my glasses, don't know where I put them. can lose my car keys, don't know where I put them on my phone. But I can still remember some of these songs that I learned back as a child. It says, do not wait until some deed of greatness you may do. Do not wait to shine your light afar. Mm -hmm. To the many duties ever near you now be true. Brighten the corner where you are, meaning wherever you go, mm -hmm. right in the corner, you can make a difference. Don't wait until uh, you think, uh, I'm waiting to do something great. Do the small things. Make a difference. Uh, be the cure. Bring relief. 
When you go, shift the atmosphere. We sing a song about God shifting the atmosphere. We can shift the atmosphere. When we walk in a room, we can shift the atmosphere with a smile, with a greeting. Mm -hmm. Even if you just shift the atmosphere for one person, mm -hmm. you can do that. Are you a welcome addition to your environment? Mm -hmm. Are you a blessing to your neighborhood? Are you a blessing to your family, to your church? Are you a blessing on the job when you walk in do you make a difference? Are you a healing force? Do you bring relief? Um, if I'm sure a lot of us have experienced you sitting, sitting at home and all of a sudden uh, the lights go out. There's a power failure. And of course you get up and you try to find your flashlight or, ca or candle. Um, now it's handy for us when we've got somebody showed me I had a flashlight on my telephone. I didn't know somebody had to tell me. So it's all right there convenient. Why do you need the flashlight? So you won't hurt yourself in the dark. We live in a world that's dark with singing. Are you one of God's flashlights? Flashlights are portable. You can take them anywhere. Um, you need to be a flashlight wherever you go and show people uh, the way to live. Show people where they can get relief. Show people how they can make their lives better. Are you one of God's flashlights? Mm -hmm. Are you a healing force wherever you go? Do you make a difference? Do you shift the atmosphere for good wherever you go? That's how we can be a healing force. God has called us to make a difference, and that's what we should do. We should brighten the corner. Uh, when we walk in, uh, and we should be able to see or to acknowledge people and see in their eyes um, that they need something. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you go and just pay attention to people, when you go into the store, um, you see these overworked store clerks. I've done that kind of work before. Um, give them a smile. Well, these are just the normal things. We may not, you know, God hasn't just called us to heal the, the, uh, the palsy or whatever. But just in your everyday life, if you got the gift of healing, good. But for those of us who don't, just your everyday going to the store, you can make a difference in a store clerk's um, life by just being polite, by just noticing them. Instead of standing there in the way, go ahead and get what you want. You see somebody say, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. You stand there talking. And the person trying to work, why not take your little class reunion a little further down and get out there way and let the person work? But uh, and, and that's how you can brighten the corner. That's how you can make a difference. Uh, when others go in with t short tempers, you can go in there pleasant um, and, and smiling. And that's how you are a flashlight in our dark world. Our world is dark with sin. And we do need to make a difference. If you hear the talk going on, um, do you just join in and keep it going? Or do you maybe change the subject? Because you know, the more you talk about something, the more it can get stirred up and get going and keep going. <laughs> you will keep it going. Or do you say, well, let's just, let's just talk about something else. So, and this is the way that you can help heal the atmosphere and help bring um, relief in a situation. God has called us to be a healing force. And we need to remember that he does indeed see our heart. He does see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we do need to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. We do so appreciate you joining us this evening for this Sunday school lesson. And we hope that it has blessed you. And we hope that you will try to be a healing force wherever you go. That you will make a difference that you will shift the atmosphere for good, that you will brighten the corner where you're at, that you will be one of God's flashlight going through this dark world. We see the darkness, we hear the darkness, we, we turn on our TV and there it is. But let me give you a warning, don't get too lost in it, come up out of it, don't just stay and keep looking. It's good to be informed, but don't just, um, Make it your your meal. Don't just don't and realize don't don't open up the door and let the devil keep you company for six hours like I did. You may you will regret it. God is good and He's worthy to be praised. And we look forward to you joining us for our next lesson. God bless you.